All right, we are live. This is First Draft Friday. It's November 13th. I am joined today by USA Today bestseller, Penny Reed. I'm so excited to have her on and um, we're gonna dive right in. Today we're talking about the self-editing process and some methods and tips that you can use um, and processes that we both go through in our self-editing. So I think it's gonna be a really exciting half hour and I can't wait to begin. Penny, can you introduce yourself and tell the audience a little bit about you? Sure, I'm Penny Reed. Um, I write, I, I frequently call them like odd romantic comedies. So typically they do have a, a thread of nerdiness throughout, whether it's a fandom like Star Wars, Star Trek, or uh, Avatar The Last Airbender, or um, they just take place on a college campus where there's the main subjects or it's across the campus of, or I should say the canvas of uh, like biochemistry or um, astrophysics or something like that. So I do, I write, I guess, nerdy romantic comedies that are strange. And I've been doing that for about seven years. Um, my background is in biostatistics and I used to be a biomedical researcher. And then I started writing full time in 2015, but I published my first book, self-published my first book in 2013. And are you self-taught? I am. I've never taken a craft course before. So when you asked me to do this today and you wanted me to focus on craft, I was like, uh, I could, you know, talk to you about failed tea tests and um, what's going on right now with the fire. But I, uh, I don't, uh, didn't necessarily feel qualified to talk about craft, um, fiction writing craft. I can talk about grant writing craft, but, um, but I did, there are some things that I think every author maybe has in common or should be doing when they're finishing up their first draft. And so I do feel qualified to talk about my self editing process. So, so well, we can talk about that. Well, I'm self-taught also. Um, so I've taken writing classes since I began. Well, I've really, I've taken classes here and there um, in writing, but I'm also self-taught in, I first of all, if anyone hasn't read Penny's books, I'm not I'm not blowing sunshine. Her books are fantastic. They really are. They're really intelligently written and well written. And um, anyone who's looking to write romance or who writes romance, if you want to read really well written um, romance, absolutely um, read Penny's books. So I'm not I, I very rarely ever rave about an author, but um, so it's it's very well. Well earned, but um, but I'm also self-taught, and I when I teach classes, I I'm like writing for dummies is what I always say because um, a lot of craft things are really high level and can be really intimidating. So I think it's really great um to have you on, especially for self-editing, because people that are self-taught like you and I, we um we do a lot of self-editing because we've learned how to make our own way in this in this world. So so let's talk about when you finish a book, when you finish a first draft, first of all, are you a plotter or um, are you an outliner? Or do you pants? I um, outline, but I, I like to write in series. So I will have a seven or an eight book series. And before I start writing on it, I outline the, the entire thing because I like to build to the last book from the first book. So I like to put Easter eggs or things that'll, that will later be important in book six and seven and eight. I like to put those in uh, book one, two, three, so that by the time book eight comes out, people are hopefully, hopefully they've enjoyed reading the series up to that point. But by the time the last book comes out, it's, a, it's an event. So people get very excited. So I like the 10 people. No, I'm just kidding. But, but it's, it's um, yeah, so I, I, I I'm a, I'm a psycho plotter. So it's not like it's, you know, it's a, uh, I maybe have manifestos <laughs> regarding my plotting. It's intense. So, but yeah, I'm I a love yeah. So your first drafts, are they typically pretty clean because you've plotted them out or what's the state um, of your first draft normally? I never, I typically never have to remove anything. I typically have to add steams. Um, <laughs> So I'll finish a book at about uh, 90 words and then I'll send it to my beta readers. And so my beta reader process is that I have about three or four 
beta readers. So they're really just readers. They're not professional beta readers because I want to get an idea of what the reviews are going to be like for the book. So what can I expect? I like to brace myself. I don't like to be surprised. And so the beta readers will come back. I have a form that they fill out. Uh, so I get consistent feedback from all sources and it's just easier for me to digest that way. And typically they say, gosh, I wish you had spent more time on, or it would have been nice to see more of, or could, could you add a scene in this fan favorite place? And I do, I like to, because of the types of books that I write, because I do write romantic comedies that are meant to entertain, um, I do like to pander a little. I like to pander to my audience and make them feel really warm and fuzzy and cozy. And um, I challenge them in other ways, but not in terms of um, consumption of entertainment. I like to entertain. So, and then after, that's the point at which, you know, I add all that stuff and then I self-edit at that point. Okay. So can you walk us through what self-editing is like so, for you? Well, I like uh, critical feedback and I like to know what I'm doing wrong. I'm not a mind reader. So I, at first, when I first started to uh, publish books, since I am self-taught, I would scour reviews on Goodreads for some usable feedback. Like how can I improve? How can I do better? And so interestingly enough, I used to click on the one and two star reviews first, notes based on their reviews, and then apply them to my next book. And things that I figured out, uh, and I actually just wrote down a list, and I, I sent it to you ahead of time, but um, it's, it's something I do for every single book. So the first thing I do after I get my notes back from the beta readers, because if I'm adding... If I'm adding to a book, I don't want to self-edit yet. I want to wait until after it's been to a beta reader and I've added all of my scenes. I take a look at any repetitive phrases. So I do have a tendency, I just did it just now, to put so at the beginning of sentences or therefore, consequently, or I um, never really quite got away from grant writing, I think. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, and so there's another one. And then... Um, that, that's a big one for me. And so I have a complete list. I just did it again. I have a complete list of out in reviews or you just have a critical eye. Uh, no, I would see sometimes in these early reviews for my early books, I would see people say she uses the same phrase over and over again. And I'm talking about one and two star reviews. They are held nothing back. Uh oh, I and think I Penny has she. froze on my side. Oh, can someone shout out in the comment section and let me know if um, Penny's froze on y'all's end? Oh, I might be the only one here. Um, well, I guess I'll continue as we wait for Alessandra to come back. Uh, what I was talking about was, I think her question was regarding the reviews. And yes, these brutal one-star reviews um, would mention repetitive phrasing or words that I had used over. Oh, here she is. She's back. <laughs> Sorry. I don't know what happened. I got knocked out. Um, you sounded like you were rocking and rolling on your own. No, I did. I just went ahead and I started continuing to explain because it's like... <laughs> There you go. It's okay. That's good. You're a pro. I was. I thought the issue was on your end. It was on my end. So okay. Go ahead. Great. Sorry. Okay. I actually checked. I like switched over and checked the comments. So they probably got some pretty epic facial expressions. Going, like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um. So yeah, I went through the reviews and I looked for all of that stuff. So the first one, repetitive phrasing. Sorry to repeat myself, but maybe it's um. Mm -hmm. Life in imitating art. Repetitive phrasing was a big one for me. And I had some words and phrases that I relied on too much. And so uh, here I go. And I'm now I'm gonna re re since I've done the and so so many times, I'm it's gonna bother me. It's gonna forever. bother you every time you do it. Yeah. Right. So do you find and replace? You start find them that way, or you just keep an eye out I while you're reading through the draft? I actually do a find, and instead of a replace, I take look at the whole section either 
rewrite the sentence because if I'm using a repetitive a phrase that I've used over and over again, typically the entire construction echoes where I've used it in the past. And I mm -hmm. that's boring to have a book where you're reading the same kinds of sentences, unless it's a stylistic choice where your narrator is maybe going mad. But in the absence of that, you, I feel like as a reader, I don't want to see that lazy. It feels very lazy to me. So yeah. at, at points where I see the repetitive phrasing, sometimes it makes sense to keep them. But sometimes I have to stop and rework an entire sentence or a thought and disallow myself from using anything similar to something I've used in the past. And so that repetitive phrasing isn't just that word like and so or and then. It's an echo throughout the book that makes it feel monotonous. Mm -hmm. So that's my that's my experience with repetitive phrasing. So that it really is digging in there and reworking the set some of the sections so that you don't have this again, this echo throughout the book. And if you're a new author listening, um, don't panic because it's one of those things when you're writing your first book, a lot of times you'll second guess every word that you write. Um, and so a lot of times something like this, it takes books and books before you recognize it in your own writing. Um, I know for me, I have certain stylistic um, patterns that can get really annoying if, if you read more more them in more than one book and now I've, I've trained myself to get, catch those in rewrites and and edit them out um but when i read my early books gosh i mean they were riddled with that but as penny said when she talks about using beta readers that are readers and not editors an editor will see that but 90 percent of these things readers don't notice they might not be crazy about the reading of the book but they can't figure out why and they don't they don't pick up on these type of things, but if you can find them and improve them with your writing from book to book, um, your books, the enjoyment level will improve and your writing improves, even if yeah. readers don't know why. <laughs> it, and it just takes a lot of time. I, I mean, prior to publishing my first book, I, I, I have books written, they're all science fiction fantasy books, but I have books that I'd written for 15 years. And I look at something I wrote, I mean, at this point, yikes, it's like over 20 years ago. And that's awful. And I'm so glad. <laughs> so painful. Yeah. I'm so glad that I spent those intervening years before I did publish my first book, just writing and writing and writing because I love to do it. Um, it. It just improved overall. So when it was time to publish that first book, I had some sense, but it wasn't, I, I, nobody had ever read them before. So it really was uh, a learning experience for me. Absolutely. I feel like I'm getting a big Well, that's good everybody. to hear because yeah. your debut is, I mean, your early books are, are so polished and well-written. So I'm glad to hear that you had so much of a history and you didn't just roll out of bed one day after <laughs> doing an experiment. And be like, I think I'm going to write this brilliant, well-written book. So, <laughs> so it's good to, it's good to know. Um, all right, so repetitive phrases. What's the next yeah. on your checklist? Next on my checklist is a search for passive voice in only. So passive voice is where you use the verb was. Is my understanding of passive voice? Uh, I please correct me. If it's I'm a aware, complicated concept. I was going to have you explain it to the audience. So, <laughs> to my mind, and I'm probably wrong since I've never taken a craft course before. My understanding of passive voice, and please correct me if. All you craft people out there, you craft yeah. people. Yeah, anyone watching, correct us. Right. My, the simplest explanation that has ever been given to me is where instead of using an, a verb, any other verb to describe an action, you use was. So to be, was, is, were, et cetera, et cetera. And um, I'm not going to give you, a, see, I have the sun, I'm in Seattle, you would think there would be no sunlight today, but randomly peeking through the clouds is sun. So every once in a while, I don't have like an alien spaceship over here or anything. A halo <laughs> effect. Yeah. Halo effect. Um, when there, you say something brilliant, it's like, ah. got, <laughs> <laughs> So, um, there, okay, so that's basically what it is. So instead of saying she, uh jumped into the room she 
it would be like she was in the room or so you're what you're basically doing is you're removing the opportunity to my mind again correct me craft people you're removing the opportunity to paint the scene more clearly uh instead of relying on was she was there um she was present she was or he was or i was or whatever it was it or even is. it's also a little showing, right? Like she was sad to hear that news or something like she that. Was sad, um, it, it was sad instead of she felt devastated. So felt would be, you know, it, it, that's terrible, but I'm much better on the page. I'm not so good with the talk. <laughs> anyway, uh, what I do is I go through the book and I look for passive voice. Sometimes pass passive voice. We just froze up for a second. Some, sometimes passive voice is a stylistic choice. If somebody feels disconnected from the action or if a person is a weak, a weak character, if the point of view is from the character who is a character who is weak, who doesn't really allow themselves to be present, especially if you're writing from first person perspective. So there was, I do have a book where at the beginning of the book, the character has heavy passive voice and over the character arc the passive voice starts to go away because the character becomes much more engaged and that was a stylistic yeah. so sometimes passive voice is appropriate especially if you're writing from first person perspective because you want to show that character arc or you want to show that emotional disconnect within a particular scene however if the passive voice wasn't purposeful that's where you go through and you look for those, again, phrases with was, is, were, and you try to rework the sentence. I do all of this at the end. I don't do this while I'm writing the book. I don't self-edit while I'm writing the book because you can't edit what you don't have written. And I would just end up editing and editing and editing and editing. So I don't even let myself do this kind of self-editing until the book is finished. So. So that's passive voice for me. All right. So um, repetitive phrases, passive voice. Passive voice. Um, what's the next one? Okay, so then I should pull your list so I can guide you better. <laughs> so the next one is uh, I since I do write in first person perspective or point, I look for adverbs, and so words that end in l y, and I only let one of my characters use adverbs typically. You see what I did there? Really? A, Typically. Anyway. I got it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm such a dork. And so. <laughs> oh, oh, with my uh, male characters, typically are the male, are the characters who I don't allow to have as many or any adverbs. And then what that does is that separates the voice of the character from, so there is a very distinct difference between the male character and the female character from writing from two different perspectives. I also just go through and look for adverbs and look again, a that's a little bit of lazy writing. I try to go through and look for ways that I can rework a sentence to remove the adverb. So I do that at the, um, at the end, unless of course, again, it's a stylistic choice. So the other, I only have two more. Um, okay, wait, wait, sorry. I don't want to interrupt you, but that was really interesting what you said. So um, you write from dual point of views or are you typically write from a singular point of view? I write from, I used to only write from one point of view, but I've started in my later books, I write from both the male perspective and the female perspective. And I do see a lot of authors who get comments or reviews that, hey, this male character sounds like a female. Yeah, the, or just like the female, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Easiest thing you can do to keep that from happening is remove all his adverbs. That's the easiest. I thing. love that trick. Yeah, I've never heard that before. Because when I I had written a book, and at the end, one of my early books, at the end of the book, I write a male perspective or a point of view, and I think it was um, my third, the third or fourth book I'd ever written, and I got a comment at the end of the book or a couple comments in a review about that scene or extra bonus that he sounded a lot like the female character. And so I started listening to the way that my brothers talk and my dad talks and my male friends talk and my husband talks and even my son. And I tried to figure out what it was about their 
dialogue or their narrative that made them that distinguished them from how typically how females talk and sure. express and i noticed a lack of adverbs <laughs> that sounds kind of nutty but <laughs> i noticed a distinct lack of adverbs and so i tried that with my next book and it just really stuck um, and so typically my male characters don't have don't use adverbs I love that. I love that. Such an actionable tip. I really love that. So when they're not using adverbs, it's in dialogue and in inner monologue. Yes. As much as oh. is possible. As much as possible. Mm -hmm. So. I love that. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Um, and we did get a great tip from um, the audience. Judy said, um, this is returning to passive voice. If you can add by zombies to the sentence and grammar still makes sense. It's it's passive. So I think um, another Facebook user said the ball was kicked is an example of a passive phrase. So the ball was kicked by zombies. Um, so I love that. Yeah. So a more active thing. I mean, even just removing the word was the or she yeah. kicked the ball. I guess it would be a better. Yeah. Right. And um, Margaret right. says, yeah. I'm going to be paying attention to how the men in my life speak now. I, mean, I am too. <laughs> yeah. And like make. I would carry around a notepad just for like a couple of days and we, it was around Christmas time. So I was at my parents' house around Christmas time, just going, you know, like <laughs> how many times do they, or what words are they using? How are they, how Our are they phrases sentences? And I would stop them every once in a while and be like, what are you thinking right now? And it's like, I'd like to hear or, you know, whatever. So <laughs> really was, basic things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Oh, okay. So, uh, along the same vein for writing for two different points of view, what I like to do is I like to assign certain words exclusively to one point of view and certain words exclusively to another. So before I said, I overuse things like therefore, consequently, thus, as such, I try to, I have to do it. Like, I know you're not supposed to do it, but I have, to, there's just something it's like, it's that grant writer in me. I have to have those words in manuscripts so and i'm gonna i'm just gonna embrace it i'm just gonna embrace my repetitive phrasing today um i add consequently and therefore to one point of view and then in the other point of view i'll do as such and thus as an example sure so so another one might be um one character might refer to their side table as a side table, and the other character would refer to their side table as a nightstand, just to distinguish them further, that they really do have their own language, their own thoughts. And then the other thing I do is one character typically will have longer sentences and another character will have shorter sentences, and this would be for their internal dialogues, just to give them just to really distinguish that this is a completely different person than in the two points of view. And I do that a lot during the self-editing portion, even though it naturally tends to come out based on the, the character that I'm writing, I'll notice. But then there is always some bleeding over when you're writing both points of view at the same time. But that's something I do during self-editing. So when you write the book do you hop back and forth between the point of views or do you write all one point of view and then all another point of view i hop back and forth yeah so, me too uh, if you can do all one and then all the other like god bless you but i cannot do that i have <laughs> i have to hop I back get and bored forth. i like to jump. Yeah. i'm like i want to go see what that other character is thinking right now in reaction to this <laughs> yeah so I love that. Um, and I really like that idea of assigning different words to different characters. I think one of the things that's really hard, and if you're a new author and you're writing your first book and you're trying to tackle multiple point of views, it's easier not to do that. It's easier in the beginning to just stick to one point of view because you do need distinct voices um, from one character to another. And that can be hard when you're first starting out um, until you really find your groove and you find your confidence. Um, we got a great question from Janet um, in the audience. And she said, do you read your manuscript out loud? So the, I don't, not during this, I do, but not during the self-editing state or stage. Typically, um, 
when I read my book out loud is when I'm stuck. So if I'm, I know what happens because I'm a plotter, but at times the characters will rebel and they will be, and they will tell me that I am wrong and they do not want to be written in that way. <laughs> because of that, I'll, you know, try and I'll try and I'll go from having maybe like a, a 6,000 word day or a series of those to like a 200 word day. And I know that means that something is going on with the characters. I have betrayed them in some way to be overly dramatic. And it is at that point I will go back and I will read parts of the book out loud so I can hear them better. I don't know if that makes any... I, when I say, when I just, I've never told anybody this. So when I describe this... We're all I'm, crazy, yeah. I'm in my attic in my wool hat telling you that I have to hear my characters. So, you know whatever no i'm i'm the same way and i read um i read dialogue a lot of times out loud when i'm writing it um because and if i get stuck a lot of times i'll dictate a scene and i i would love to dictate more i just it doesn't it's not the way my brain works but if i'm stuck a lot of times i'll try dictating a scene um because i and i I know I sound like a crazy person to anyone who's listening to me because I do use different voices for different characters. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> well, I don't think that's true. You know, <laughs> you know so uh, if anyone was listening outside my, I don't write in the attic, but I write in the garage. But if anyone's listening to me, they would think I'm crazy. <laughs> um, but, um, we did have have a response. Uh, Margaret said she tried using different words to describe the same thing by character couch versus how do you say that? Devon? Is that the right way to pronounce it? I don't even know that word. That's a fancy word, Margaret. Um, my editor questioned it and thought it might confuse the reader. What's your take on that? So okay, so that's a really great question. I think perhaps in that particular case, because we're talking about empirical data rather than an aggregate data set. In this particular case, I think it was the word Devon because I, I didn't immediately know what that particular word was. However, Me either. if you said sofa and couch, I don't know that you would have gotten the same um, response from your editor. Um, or if you're just using that as an example, that's, if she was truly confused by nightstand versus side table, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I would, I would maybe if you have another beta reader or if you have your proofreader queued up, maybe have them read a couple of chapters and just say, my editor had a question and I'm not going to tell you what it is. I just want you to read these first four chapters and I want to see if you have the same question or same concerns. So that would be putting them in blind. So that's a, single blind um read <laughs> just to see if they're going to be get, getting more data i would i would say i have found that it works really well for me i don't get reviews and again this is reviews would be data in aggregate i don't get a lot of reviews from people who are why did she use nightstand with his perspective and table with her perspective um, and I do still scour the two and the one and the two star and three star reviews sometimes just to take a look if there's something that I've some in some way I've gotten lazy that I can pick up on. Um, yeah, if you can approach your reviews from a non-emotional place, but really from the perspective of a learning experience, that is that is great. And I had a, it I can had, be hugely helpful. Yeah. Yeah helpful and i know reviews are for readers they're not for authors but sometimes you'll get across you'll come across a review a two or a one star review where the person is really helpfully critical um i had a lot of experience get reading horrible reviews from grant reviewers and so to me it's it, it was really a well how can i improve my craft how can the next time i submit to this particular reviewer they're going to rate my uh, grant highly so I do look at reviews from that perspective rather than a, did they like my book? I don't care if they yeah. like it. I'm more interested in what I can take from them, exploit from their reviews so that I can become a better writer. I, I love that. I agree wholeheartedly. And especially in the beginning when I didn't have money for an editor, reviews were my editors. Like, I mean, that, and the beauty of self-publishing is you can go and change something and fix it and 
you know, um, and learn from that. Uh, a lot of comments are saying, um, Devon, I still think I'm mispronouncing that. It's Davenport um, is the older phrase. So a great use of that. And I think that word just kind of jarred them because it is a, such a unique thing. But in, a great example of this is if you have an older character, like a a point of view of an older character, she's going to refer to things in different ways and notice different things. That's a lot of, when I switch point of views, um, a character who's a fashion designer might make a lot of references to what people are wearing yes. um, that they're interacting with, where your football player, I mean, I'm not meaning to be stereotypical, but where, you know, your, or your, you know, man in the woods could care absolutely less or notice what you know, any of the other characters are wearing, but, you know, something really bothers him about that character, like, you know, in a different way. So that's always um, try to think about the personalities of your characters and that and their observations, because everybody observes different things and notices different things. Right. That's right. That's a, that's a really good point. Um, we are um, we're going to have to zoom through your lap. You have one more or two more or and I'll make it really fast. Um, I just searched through sections of the book, and this is just when I read through for sections of the book that have two or more paragraph of paragraphs of expository with no action or no dialogue. And I try to either, if they're having a long period of time where they're thinking about something or they're just talking to themselves too much, I try to interrupt it with, or if they're explaining something, I try to interrupt it with either dialogue or action. And that just keeps... To me, that just keeps the book, the pace of the book moving much quicker, much faster, uh, more engaging rather than let's stop and chat and think about this. And think thing. all about my feelings on the subject. So um, define expository for someone who might not know what that is. So expository, again, I'm I'm going to use the definition that I use because I, uh, I've i never taken it. I need to take a craft course. That's the moral of the story. Um, I'm a, I'm a little afraid to take a craft course, to be honest, because so far it's working for me. Yeah, so. you don't want to mess with the, yeah. Does it matter if you know what expository is? I mean, really, right? So my understanding is it's like backstory or explanation of something that the reader needs to know. Is, right. is that your take on it? The explanation, backstory, or a person thinking through their feelings or processing something that has occurred. Yeah. But then... It's where there's no action that takes place. And it's really a lot of just telling the reader something rather than showing it through action. Okay. So your rule of thumb is two paragraphs. Two paragraphs. Because once okay. you. If it's more than two, you need to break it up. I feel that way about my own yeah. book. For the pace of romantic comedies, more than two, and you really just need to break it up. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> I love that. All right. And that one more, you had one more. Oh no, that was it. That's that it. was it. All right. Perfect. We do, we technically are out of time, but I do want to um, try to answer these last um, few questions that we had. Um, so someone else try to find it, ask how many um, editors do you use? If you don't so, mind sharing. No, that's between totally developmental fine. proofreader, how many people or professionals are seeing your manuscript? How many professionals are seeing? Three. Three professionals are seeing. So I do have anywhere between non-professionals would be three to six beta readers. And then I get it back and I self-edit. And then I have a copy line editor. I use my beta readers for developmental edits. I've tried using a developmental editor before and it just did not work for me. So once I, I just have to rely on myself. And so after I get through the beta reader self-editing, I go to a copy line editor and then I go through two different proofreaders. Sometimes we'll also go to a third proofreader depending on if I need, um, if there's, there's some concepts within that are super technical. For example, I have a book series called uh, uh, Laws of Physics and I, I do a lot of discussion on astrophysics and so theoretical astrophysics. She's a theoretical astrophysicist. And so I did use a proofreader just to make sure that I was structuring the sentences 100% correctly, et cetera, et cetera, when I was talking about that particular area of expertise. Oh, and if I'm writing from a perspective that is different than my own, so I don't share that perspective. So if I'm writing about, or if the point of view is a black woman, or if the point of view is a, a Latino man, 
then what I also do is I will pay for a uh, sensitivity reader to it, always a professional, always pay your professionals. I'll have um, professional sensitivity readers go through and make sure that the voice sounds authentic, that I haven't whitewashed it and I haven't turned that person or that character into a stereotype. That's great. And where do you typically find your sensitivity readers? So for sensitivity readers, you can, Twitter is a really great, I know that sounds awful, but Twitter is a really great resource. Um, the first person I always contact is Angela James. She is the former, or she's a, she now runs her own business, but she left Karina Press where she was the head of Karina Press and she formed her own business. And she really has her finger on the pulse of where to find a lot of editing professionals for very specific purposes. So Angela James on Twitter, I just reach out to her. She also has a submission form on her website for romance authors, uh, but she probably could hook up non-romance authors as well. Um, she's just really, she's really dug into publishing and, um, and uh, editing professionals. So she's a great place. I to love start. that. That's a great resource. Yeah. And we'll put um, in the uh, section below, we'll add um, a link to her profile. So I appreciate that. Um, the last thing um, a user just said, Penny, I love, love your covers. They look like really witty books. And I'm going to now I'm going to read them and find out. So oh. if you're interested in reading, <laughs> reading Penny's um, books, you can visit her website at pennyread.ninja. What was the book that you referenced where it starts with passive voice and gets less passive? I meant to ask you the title. Uh, no problem. The name of the book was called Beer Science. It's the third book in the Winston Brothers series. And it's the female character point of view. She goes on a character journey from being very passive as a person to finding her independence in, by figuring out who she is. That's how you find your independence. That's how you get a backbone. It's figuring yeah. out who you are. And so uh, over the course of the book, she started using more action verbs rather than by zombies. So yeah, go. rather than by zombies. I love that. And if someone was going to start with your book or is there a book that you're really proud of or is there a book that you would say this is the first book of mine that you should read? I typically tell people to read um, the fourth book in the Knitting in the City series first. They're all standalones. All my books are standalones, so you don't have to read any one before the other. Um, the fourth book, which is called Beauty and the Mustache, because you'll get a really good sense for the types of books I write. I feel like it touches all of the main points. Um, if you don't like Beauty and the Mustache, you're not going to like any of my other books. And it's uh, it focuses on, there's a lot of quotes by Nietzsche in it, and there's like, it's bizarre. And so if you like that kind of bizarreness, then you'll like the rest of my backlist. And if you don't, no judgment. Lots of people don't like my books. It's totally great. So I'll still make eye contact. It's fine. <laughs> and that was Beauty and the Mustache. I think you broke up the first time you said it, so I just want to make sure. Uh, and it was so great to have you. So thank you so much. Thank you to everyone who joined us live. If you're watching this later or listening to this on our podcast, um, please follow our accounts. Please like and comment. On, on these live chats. It's great to have you guys here. We're Authors AI. Um, and if you visit authors.ai, you can check out artificial intelligence editing tools for authors. And we have a really cool um, artificial intelligence robot named Marlo, who I think you're gonna love. So, um, so thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, Penny, for sharing your wisdom with the audience. And um, we will see you guys in two weeks at our next First Draft Friday. So thank you guys. Thank you. Bye.